Any mothers and fathers here? Raise your hands. Mothers and fathers. Any children here? Where are the children? Where are the children? Say hello. Hello. All right. Good. Are there any singles here? Let me hear you sing. Singles. Oh, come on. There's more singles than that. Come on. Don't be shy. You're not shy when you walk out that door and start greeting each other. So, singles are families too. Amen? That's right. Are there any people here who are widows or widowers? Your spouse is not with us anymore. They've, they've passed away. Raise your hands, please. Praise the Lord for you. Your families too. Amen? And in this day and age, we also are going to recognize that there might be some people whose husband and wife is not here in the United States. Maybe they're back home. Is there anybody here who's without their spouse? Raise your hand. Okay, your families too. We talk to families who are separated. Now there are some who might be younger. Are there any single parents here? Because you don't have help raising your children. You're raising your children all by yourself. Any single parents or, or parents who are raising children alone? Okay, I see some hands. Any, any grandparents here who are raising your grandchildren? Raise your hand if you're a grandparent and you're raising your, you're raising your children's children. Raise your hand up. Well, praise the Lord. God bless you. Because you're raising children two times. So when we talk to families, we're talking to you too. And family ministries help all kinds of families. So I want you to understand our topic for today is going to address some of those needs of every family. But before we even introduce that, let me tell you what the topic is today. The topic is hospitality in the 21st century. There you go. I heard that part. I heard that part. And it's important for us to know that things have changed a whole lot, so we're going to talk about how to be hospitable in this time and in this period of life. Now let me tell you a little bit about family ministries. Other than addressing parents, we also address the needs of married couples. In fact, at the end of this month, actually March 23 through 25, we're having a marriage retreat for couples. And we sent the word out to all of our churches and to all of our family ministry leaders and pastors so that they could announce. So you, if you're a couple, they would like to go away for a weekend and learn how to be a better couple as a Christian, then that's what this retreat was about. <laughs> I don't remember seeing any names from Metro. So 
If you are interested in something like that, we're, we're filled up now, but maybe next year you can have an opportunity or we can do one just for your church. So we'll talk to your leaders and to your pastor about what, how we can do that. Now speaking about marriage, let me share this with you. There was a little boy who was going to preschool. And at home one day he was talking to his mother. And you know how little boys love their mothers. And this little boy said, Mommy, when I grow up, I'm going to marry you. <laughs> now his sister was standing right there and she said, you can't marry your own mother. <laughs> then the little boy said, Then I'll marry you, sister. <laughs> you can't marry me either. <laughs> so he looked confused. <laughs> so his mother explained to him, <laughs> You can't marry someone in your own family. And he began to cry. He says, you mean I have to marry a total stranger? <laughs> Most of us, when we get married, marry strangers. <laughs> and some of us spend the whole marriage getting to know our spouses. But it can also be a lot of fun. So when we talk about this period of time that we're living in, the 21st century, we want to go to the Bible as we did in Romans 12 and we're told in verse 13 that we ought to be hospitable. We ought to practice hospitality. And as we go to the word of God today, let's ask the Holy Spirit to make clear to us what we need to understand about hospitality. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Loving God, you welcome us because you created us as your own. And now we're asking you, dear Lord, to show us and to recreate for us how to be hospitable Christians. In Jesus' name, okay. amen. Well, having read from Romans, the 12th chapter, I want to read from a different uh, version or translation that puts it in today's language. So I'm reading from those same verses beginning with verse 9 through 13, but I'm reading from a version of the Bible called the New Living Translation, which takes the Greek and Hebrew and translates those same words from the King James into words we use every day. And this is what Paul is saying. Don't just pretend to love others. How many of you can agree with that? You don't want anybody to pretend to love you. You want some real love. The, Paul says, really love them. Hate what is wrong. Hold tightly to what is good. 
Love each other with genuine affection. Or with brotherly love. And take delight in honoring each other. Never be lazy. But work hard. And serve the Lord enthusiastically. Rejoice in our confident hope. Be patient in trouble. And keep on praying. When God's people are in need, be ready to help them. Always be eager to practice hospitality. That's good instruction, isn't it? There was one time, how many of you have ever heard of Queen Victoria? Lived in England quite a while ago. Well, she occasionally would visit some of the cottages of her subjects and one time she entered the home of a widow and stayed to enjoy a brief period of Christian fellowship with her. Later on, the poor woman was taunted by her worldly neighbors. And they said to her, Granny, Grandmother, who's the most honored guest you've ever entertained in your home? Now they expected her to say, Jesus. For despite their constant ridicule of her Christian witness, they recognized her deep spirituality. But to their surprise, she answered, the most honored guest I've entertained is Her Majesty the Queen. They said, did you say queen? Oh, we caught you this time. How about this Jesus you're always talking about? Isn't he the most honored guest you've ever entertained in your home? Now her answer was definite and it was scriptural. She said, no indeed. He's not a guest. He lives here. <laughs> All of her hecklers were silenced. <laughs> Hospitality in the Bible is about God, about Jesus living in your house. It's not necessarily only about putting out cookies and punch <laughs> or serving a nice meal. <laughs> it's about treating people as Jesus would treat people. <laughs> First Peter 4 9 says, <laughs> Use hospitality one to another without grudging. We also in, hear about hospitality in 1 Timothy chapter 3, in Hebrews chapter 13, in 3 John verses 6 through 8, and we just read from 1 Peter 4, 9. But what I want you to understand today is this concept of hospitality was not a New Testament concept. What Paul was talking about came from the Old Testament times, the ancient times, and was kept going in the times of Jesus Christ. So we need to understand what hospitality was long ago. But let's first of all describe the world after sin. Because the world after sin was not a pretty picture. 
In fact, when you look into Genesis the third, the sixth chapter, we will recognize that God is addressing Noah about the people who lived around him. And I want you to turn to chapter 6 and I want you to look down through there and you will see in Genesis chapter 6 where God is talking about how he has a difficult time in understanding how people were living and living in a way that was violent and sinful, so much so that he said, I regret that I created man. Man is so wicked and he's so violent that I can't let it continue to exist. And God says, I'm going to have to destroy this people and start all over again. The conditions during the time of Noah were of such that God says, I'm going to destroy this world and start with man all over again. And rather than us take the time to read it, I want you to go through chapter 6 through 9 because he even says there are even men who are so violent that they're taking lives. They're killing other people. And this is where God said, I tell you that if someone takes another life, he'll have to play, pay with his own blood. That's how much God hates violence and he hates killing among men. <laughs> and I say to you today that we're living in an age where it's beginning to happen just as the Bible said in the New Testament as it was in the days of Noah so shall it be in the days of what? The coming of the Son of Man. Now, God loved Noah because, in the midst of all the violence and killing, Noah was a man after God's own heart. So, God said to Noah, Noah, I want you to build an ark and I want you to go in and I want you to take the animals that I plan to send and I want you to invite everybody who believes in God to get in the ark with you. God says I'm going to create justice out of chaos. I'm going to create new life out of the violence that has been here. And I'm going to be hospitable by helping to bring safety and justice to those who love God. And after 120 years of Noah preaching and inviting people to follow God, how many people went into the ark? Young people, how many people went into the ark? How many? How many? Seven and Noah. Noah and seven. Eight. Which makes eight. Eight people. Noah and his wife. Noah's three sons and their wives. Went into the ark. So Noah. 
and his three sons, we're all related to them. Amen. Because God destroyed all life. All animal life that was left outside, all people were destroyed, and God began with Noah and his family. Eight, eight people. Now God says, I hate violence. Yeah, it says that in Malachi, the second chapter. But God is willing to destroy people who are violent. That's how much he hates violence. Because he doesn't like it when people don't treat other people right. Now we love to talk about the marriage and giving in marriage, the marrying and divorce. You know, the Bible says there were a lot of beautiful women and men took every woman they wanted to and married her. Some of them had multiple wives. But then they began to fight each other began to destroy each other because they were very selfish. Selfishness is just the opposite of hospitality. God brought things into justice, but yet he showed mercy to Noah and his wife and his three sons and their wives. Now some people may ask, why is God interested in destroying so much? Well, that's another question we're going to have to answer in another sermon. But God does not destroy people who love him and who respond to him. Amen. When you show love for God and love for others, God keeps you as a witness of who he is. Now you would think that after all of this happened and Noah came out of the ark and his three sons and their, 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 their wives came out, you'd think that things would get better, right? But you see, sin never leaves you alone. And even after you make a decision to follow God, sin follows you. And it wasn't too long after Noah got out of, out of the ark that his own sons ridicule him and embarrass him. In other words, it wasn't very safe in Noah's house. There wasn't the kind of sincere hospitality that there should have been in Noah's house. But you know what? God is a long-suffering God. And he promised I will not destroy the earth again by flood. And we praise the Lord for that. However, some of us worried about it this past year when Harvey came. Amen. We said, Lord, I thought, I thought you said you weren't going to destroy us with water. Well, he came, well, the devil came close. That wasn't the Lord. Amen. That was Satan in his acts who brought that on to us. It's God who saves and redeems. It's Satan who destroys. Because he wants to turn and blame God. That's why the insurance companies call Harvey an act of God. And what they should do is call Harvey in the insurance clause an act of Satan. 
Bona in his sore and sick, I think a Kinega Korkenya Sai, Ivano Atenga, a Kinega Korya Saita. Because we serve a hospitable God. Now you know the Bible very well, so I'm not going to try to read everything to you. But when you go through the Bible, you will also see in Genesis 18 that Abraham, who was Abram, he called Abram out of Ur, out of an eastern place, an eastern country, into this new relationship with God and told him, I want you to go and make a new nation. I want you to see God's pattern. Man messes up and God redeems. Amen. Even though God is a just God, He's also a merciful God. And when He mess when you mess up, He wants to give you a new start. Because He's a God of mercy and of grace. So He called Abram and He said, Abram, I want you to bring your family out from where you live. Because in the land of Ur, there are people who do not serve God. And when Abraham came out, he brought his nephew, his name was Lot. Anybody remember Lot? Yeah. Lot had a tendency to be kind of selfish. Because he was living among Abraham, and Abraham and Lot were both very wealthy men. And they had a lot of family, and they had a lot of cattle, and a lot of business to do, but they got in each other's way, and their house was not a safe place to live in. So they began to be contentious with each other. So Abraham said, I tell you what, Lot. There's enough land here for all of us. So I want you to make a choice about where you can take all your riches and all your people and all your family so that we don't have to be doing this with each other. And I'll let you choose first and then I'll go where you don't go. Doesn't that sound like your relatives sometimes? Sometimes you start doing this and you need to do this. Yeah. So Lot chose a place and the Bible says he tent, he pitched his tents toward what? Toward Sodom. Now Sodom was a violent city. It was an adulterous city. It was a city where they did not know God, but it looked like bright lights and good time. You know, some of us make choices like that sometimes. We go to the city instead of the country. <laughs> we like all the things that the city offers us. But it's those very things we like that get us in trouble. And before you know it, Lot got in trouble down in Sodom. In fact, some folks came through and kidnapped him and his family and all of his stuff and took him away and made him captive. Abraham had to come after him. I want to show you something very special. As hospitable a guy as Abram was, he had over 300 men that he trained to be soldiers. How many of you work security? Anybody here work security? Yeah. He trained some men to work security for him so that if anybody tried to take his stuff, he'd have an army ready to get them and to, and to make sure that they didn't take his stuff. Abraham 
So God used Abraham and his soldiers to go and rescue Lot and save Lot from destruction and from economic defeat. But guess what? Lot still stayed in Sodom. <laughs> you think he'd move from Sodom after that, right? It's dangerous in Sodom. It may be good times, but you got to watch out for yourself in Sodom. Oh, Abram really showed how much he was a man of God. He not only responded when God called, Abram also responded when three strangers came to his house. Now, we already established that in that area, everybody was a law unto themselves. And it was not safe. So being hospitable during those times means that when three strangers come to your house, you say, you can't afford to be out there by yourself because it's dangerous here. Why don't you come into my house? And, and stay here a while and eat with me. And I will keep you safe. You see, this is what God calls hospitality. Yeah. God says, if I give you something, that helps you to be prosperous. If I give you something that's safe where you can live, I want you to make sure that you're there when I send somebody who needs safety. When somebody needs help, I want to be able to send them to your house because you are a hospitable person. You practice hospitality. But you know what happens sometimes? Even inside your house, it's not safe. Amen. Sometimes inside your house, people don't treat each other well. Amen. Amen. Sometimes we need protection from our own relatives. Amen. Now this afternoon, we're going to talk about how to organize your house to keep it safe. Amen? If you want to know how to keep your house safe, come this afternoon. We'll show you how God has a plan to make sure your house is safe. Now, according to the Bible, these three men were what? Were they just strangers? No. They were angels. In fact, one of them was who? One of them was the son of God. Have mercy. Came to visit Abraham. Now wouldn't it be nice if they came to your door? You know, if they came to my community, my community says nobody can knock on the door to ask you for anything. That's right. I live in one of those kind of communities. But I tell you, if God sends three men and three angels to my house, I'm going to open the door. Amen? Whatever they got, I want. <laughs> Abraham opened his door and said, come in here and be safe, be protected, and let me share what God gave me, and I'm going to share it with you. Praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. Can God trust you that he can send angels to your house? Or maybe you won't recognize them because there's too much fighting going on. But in Abraham's house, these three men talked to him, these angels and the Son of God, and said, listen, we're going to come down here and we're going to destroy Sodom. Because God says, whoever kills people and violent to people and who messes up people, I'm going to take them out. And so Abraham said, oh, wait a minute. My nephew Lot lives in Sodom. You going to take him out too? Listen, if God is coming to destroy something, you better not live there. Amen. <laughs> Abraham knew Lot was in trouble again. And so he made a bargain with God and he bartered all the way down. If you can find 10 people in Sodom, 
Will you save it? Say, okay, Abraham, I want you to count on both hands. And if you come up with 10 people who serve God, I'll save Sodom. Guess what? He could not find 10 people, not even in Lot's house. Help me, Jesus. <laughs> When God comes to count in God's church and in your homes, will he find 10 yes, that makes your home worth saving? Yes, sir. Don't answer that question, but give it consideration. Thank you. And they told him, Lot, since you can't, uh, Abraham, since you cannot find 10 people, we're going to destroy Sodom. But they, prom he pr they promised Abraham, we'll go to Lot and we'll make sure that he has a chance to be saved. Praise the Lord. Amen. I don't care how bad it gets or how rough it gets. God is in the saving business. He only destroys that which wants to destroy his people. And we know what happened, don't we? Those three men came and knocked on his door. Lot opened the door because like Abraham, he was a hospitable person. He knew true hospitality. And he told those men, guys, you better get out the streets. Men, come into my house for safety. Not just to have a meal, but there's some men out there who want to have you as if you were women. Are you listening to me? Lot knew that his neighborhood was a tough neighborhood. And the men told him, say, Lot, you don't have time to pack. You don't have time to call a moving company. You don't have time to rent a van or a truck. You got to get out now because God is going to destroy this wicked city. So he took his daughters and his wife and he fled from Sodom. Praise God. Except his wife had sort of kind of liked the culture of Sodom. She liked the place that she could get her hair done and the spas and the nice dress shops. Did I say hair done? I should have said she knew where she could go and get some hair. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> because this culture likes always looking good. Amen. <laughs> so she had a longing in her heart that was not for God. Her longing were for the good times in Sodom. Now God saved Lot's family, but Lot's wife lost her own life. Amen? It's not that Lot didn't try. He was a hospitable guy. He tried to use protection, and he tried to follow the instructions of God. God has told us in Adventist home, through his servant, the prophet, that the times today are not too different from the times a lot. Some of us are having difficult in our families and among our relatives because our heart is not in God's heart. We have gotten wrapped up in the culture around us. Some of us may have planted or pitched our tents too close to Sodom. Now I'm going to be honest with you. Just like we know in the spirit of prophecy, God has told us that God always gives us warnings. He always gives us signs. He always gives us an opportunity to repent. He always gives us a new start so we can follow God. 
Some of us, though, don't hear God's calling because we're wrapped up in the culture around us, which is not from God. Now, the one thing I really love about Lot, that even though his wife was lost, his children were saved. Praise the Lord. Amen. Lot was teaching them something good about God so that when Lot said, let's follow God's instruction and do it God's way, his daughter said, we're with you. Yes. It's time for us families to examine how much time we're spending with our families. We let the church have the hospitality and we don't create a hospitable home environment even for our own children. Our children should not come up without knowing who God is and the ability to make a decision to follow God because their parents are God-fearing parents who spend time with their children. Whatever takes you away from building God inside of your children, is going to be held to your account. Yeah, we all have to work. We all have to travel back and forth in this big metropolitan area. But what's more important? The money we earn or the children that God gives us? Just like it was in the days of Lot, so it is today. We need to understand that we have a responsibility to create a God place inside of our family home. Now the thing that was interesting, after Abraham saved Lot, you know what the first thing he did? He didn't come back to Lot and say, I told you so. You know, we like to tell people, I told you so. It says that when Abraham came back to his house, he built an altar, and he thanked God he was able to rescue Lot's family. Abraham was in the habit of building altars to God. That's why God could trust him with a little bit of cattle, and a whole lot of riches because he knew it was only because of the blessing of God and he was willing for his family to know that it was God who gave us this blessing. What I'm trying to share with you today, folks, as we try to wind this thing down, is that we have to make decisions about whether our house is God's house and a house of uh, hospitality, or whether it's a house pitched towards Sodom. What are your children doing when you're out working 12 to 16 hours a day? I know it takes a lot in order to pay the rent, pay the mortgage, buy the food, buy the clothes. But you know what? Even if I have a few less clothes, it really means that maybe I have more Jesus. Even if I have a little less of new things to put into my house, it's better to have a fewer things and more Jesus. It's time to go home and build the altar to God and gather your children and your family around you and make your house a house of, of hospitality. See, we've been from church to church and the church always treats us well. But you know what? I came from a house 
that learn how to be a house of hospitality. We didn't depend upon the church to be hospitality. Isn't that right? My wife came from that kind of home. The home was made to be a hospitable place, to create a place for justice and safety and take people in and care for them and introduce them to Jesus Christ. And when our children saw what we were doing in our home for God, they are now adults and they're doing the same thing in their home. Praise the Lord. They don't get it unless they get it from the parents. If you're too busy to do it, then you're too busy. And it's time to make a new decision for Jesus Christ. I'll tell you the kind of Jesus that we have. The Bible tells us in the New Testament that he didn't even have a place to lay his head. Wherever he was is where he slept. Amen. And once in a while, he went to some friend's house to sit down and rest and talk to them. But you know what? His disciples learned to do that too. They watched Jesus spend time in prayer. They watched Jesus teach. They listened to Jesus as he told them parables and stories that helped to introduce who God was to them. He made disciples his family. Amen. Because he is a Jesus of hospitality. In fact, David talked about him in the 23rd Psalms when he said, Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of my enemies. What did he do at the Last Supper? He brought together his family of disciples and he gave them bread and he gave them wine and then he says this represents the fact that I'm going to give my body too. Are you willing to be hospitable and give what you have for the cause of Jesus Christ? Give your home, give your energies to teaching and sharing about Jesus Christ and what he's done for you. Jesus says to us today that we need to understand what real hospitality is. Real hospitality is Jesus coming and getting down in front of his disciples and washing their feet. The dusty feet of men who walked in from a muddy road. He gave himself to them money he didn't give to them but he gave himself true hospitality is when you give yourself to someone else when your children see you doing this they know that you're a Christian but if they don't see it happening in their house Lord have mercy now I'm going to ask you a very real question when is the last time you washed your family's feet Oh, you go out and wash everybody's feet in the church. But when's the last time you washed your wife's feet? When's the last time you washed your husband's feet? Lord have mercy. When's the last time you let your children wash your feet? Because sometimes children hold grudges against parents. And it's time to confess them and come clean. You see, that's true hospitality. When you invite a person to accept you as God's person. The things in the world, they're going to go up in the fire, folks. Just like Sodom. There is no archaeological dig that has found Sodom and Gomorrah. They found all other cities out there in Canaan and all the other places where Israelites live. But they have not found Sodom and Gomorrah. You know why that is? Because when Jesus destroys, he destroys perfectly. Amen. There wasn't a brick left. There wasn't a house left. There weren't even bones left. Lord have mercy. It's time to make a decision about hospitality. Inviting Jesus into your house, into your life, and dedicating your life to serving him 
and letting your children know why you do what you do. Why do you serve God? Why do you give up so much for God? Why do you talk about Jesus all the time? Why do you sing the hymns of Zion? It's not because you have to, it's because Jesus saves. <laughs> Yes, it's because Jesus is in your heart yes, and you're grateful for what he's done for you. How are you going to pay him back? Are you going to pay him back with furniture and houses <laughs> and a new job? Now, there's nothing wrong with new jobs. But when they replace your dedication and commitment to Jesus Christ, you no longer are God's agent of hospitality. When you give of yourself, in order to serve God's purpose of saving souls, then you become God's agent of hospitality. But God says to us, I'm going to ask you one question. And this afternoon we're going to talk about it. Because in the end he's going to say, where's your flock? Huh? You see, a lot of our young adults and teenagers, they see one kind of person at church and a different kind of person at home. Amen? Yeah. And they say, I can't believe because I see you what you say and what you do at the house. You're not that hospitable at home. So why should I go to your church? And the first thing young people do and young adults do is that they don't go to church anymore. Because they haven't seen a sincere and true and real Christian at their house. True hospitality begins at home. True love begins at home. True marriage begins at home. Not in Victoria's Secret. Oh, some of you know what I'm talking about. That's fake love. That's phony love. Real love is when you give yourself for somebody else in the name of Jesus Christ. Are you ready to make that decision today? You see, I'm not going to call you out and tell you to admit all the wrongs you've done because you need to reserve a little bit of pride in front of your children. Amen? But you know, your children know more about you than I know. Amen? So I'm not even going to look at them right now. I'm looking at you. It's time to make a choice. Are you pitch your tent in front of Sodom? Or maybe just inside the city limits? Or maybe just in the suburbs of Sodom? Where is your loyalty? How much time do you give God other than on the Sabbath day? In fact, from what I hear, the time you give God on Sabbath day ends when the sermon is over. I heard that the most, most of the people after the sermon is over, you don't see them again until next week. Amen. <laughs> Guess what? That's happening all over North America. We have absentee members all during the week. But they always show up at 11 o'clock on Sabbath morning. Amen. What's your choice? Do you belong to Jesus all the time? Will you make that decision and that choice? I'm going to ask you not to come up here. I'm going to ask you to bow your heads and offer a prayer to God and ask him for the strength to make the right decision and shame the devil. Amen. With your eyes closed, and your heads bowed, and when you finish that prayer, if you have made a decision about your family and God, I want you to just stand to your feet very quietly, still with your eyes closed and your head bowed, because it's not about anybody for you to see or for them to see you. Your choice and your decision is with God. So right now, when you finish your prayer, just quietly stand where you are, keeping your head bowed, keeping your eyes closed, because it's not about who's sitting here. It's about God and what he's done. You see, he went to the cross for you and for me and gave his blood that we might have life.
right now an eternal life when he comes again. Will you accept that from him? He's the God of hospitality. Are you willing to stand and give him the rest of your life? The rest of your energies and strength so that even though you have a job, you also have a schedule and a time to be with your family at home. So even if you're not around, if Jesus should come and you're at work, you know that your family's safe because they have made a decision about Jesus Christ. You ready to stand up? Just to stand up quietly. You and God, make that choice, make that decision. Nobody else's business, just yours. You don't have to tell anybody what you told God. That's between you and God. Pastor, this is your flock. I've come here to be a partner with you. And our partnership means that I have preached the word of God and I've asked for people to make decisions. But as a shepherd of the flock, you must pray a prayer of dedication and reconsecration and a new start for your family. Yes. Will you do that now, please? Yes. Let's pray together. Our God, we thank you for who you are. We thank you because you are a merciful, you are long-suffering God. We thank you even in our messes. You still, you want to reconstruct yes. our lives. Yes, Lord. Where is our house? Yes. Where do we pinch our tents? Where are we? Where is that little flock? Where are our children? Where are our wives? Yes, our Lord. Husbands? Yes. Yes. Where are our grandmas, grandparents? Yes, Lord. Where are our people? Can we be Please, Lord. always with you? Not only on the Sabbath day and the Sabbath morning, but all the seven days. Yes, Lord. And when it comes to the seventh day, the Sabbath, we come together. Yes, Lord. Live with your families as a family, a body of Jesus. Yes. Lord. We come to praise you, to glorify you together as a church family. We pray this day as each individual has prayed, you know the challenge of each one of us. Yes, Lord. You know what they have spoken to you. Answer them according to your will. For last, God, we pray as Metro Community Church, yes, as a family, yes. reform us. May we know the hours of the Sabbath. Not only to listen to someone and we go. God, renew our minds. Please, that Lord. when we yes. go this yes. day, we come back to listen to yes, your word. Lord. Not only today, but all the Sabbaths that are coming. That we glorify your name. And so that the family members can know who we are. The community to know that we are Seventh-day Adventists who come to wash you this day. Yes, Lord. From this day on, God, forgive us. Accept us. Give us new beginning. Yes. New start. Yes. So that God, we may go home rejoicing. Amen. Always, not on this day, but every day. May we have you every day, God. Thank you for the man servant. You have spoken to us through him. Thank you. We thank you. Accept us, God, as we have this break as we come back to continue running more about you. Thank you for accepting us. Yes, Lord. For this we ask yes. in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Remain standing. Romans 12th chapter, second verse says to us in a, one of those versions of the Bible, don't let the world squeeze you into its mold. But be changed by the renewing of your mind. Make up your mind. You have a made up mind today. Amen? 
Now God needs to protect your mind from a violent man called Satan, that old devil. You've got to keep the Holy Spirit with you. You've got to call on him and make sure your renewed mind also produces some new behavior. Amen? Praise God. You may be seated.